When you're designing a digital assistant, it is useful to upfront think what kind of questions a user might ask. So let's say we've got a user over here, and let's also pretend that we're making a digital assistant that will allow you to order pizzas. I will call this assistant PizzaBot for now. Then let's consider some of the functionality that we'd like to have. Well, first and foremost, we'd like you to be able to order a pizza. This is going to be probably the main feature of the assistant. But you can also imagine that there's information that the user might want to retrieve. Things like allergy information, nutritional information. Now users might also ask questions that have little to do with ordering a pizza, but are part of the conversational dialogue nonetheless. So that means that we might need to prepare some responses to questions like, what is your name? Are you a bot? And maybe the odd silly question like, what's your favorite pizza? Now this is not a complete picture of what pizza bot should be able to do perhaps, but we can see a pattern. Everything that's happening over here falls into the chit chat category. And you can argue that these two, these fall into the frequently asked questions category. And the interesting thing about these two categories is that these two categories are relatively simple. For every type of intent that we come up with here, we have one basic response and that's about it. There's no story that really needs to be kept in mind here because the intent to action mapping is pretty much one-to-one. -one. For example, no matter what happens, if the user is asking for allergy information or nutritional information, then we always have to utter the text that brings them to the appropriate page that has that information. And similarly, all of these questions have a single sentence answer. So there's something interesting at play here. Chit chat as well as frequently asked questions are really common use cases for digital assistants. And they usually have a one-to-one -one mapping as we see here. But another convenient part of this is that frequently asked questions can be seen as a category. So you might almost say we can do something in a two-step approach. We might be able to say, hey, the intent that we have, first and foremost, that's frequently asked question. And what we can do now is we can have a second classifier determine which of these sub-intents is the most appropriate, and that can then give us the most appropriate response. So that means that we can have intent classification, and after that, we might also be able to have a response selection happen. And this response selection is a somewhat recent feature that I figured would be valid to highlight because it makes chatbot design quite simple in a lot of cases. So in this video, I'm going to explain to you how response selection works inside of Raza. What you see here on the right-hand side of the screen is a Raza pipeline. You can often find it in the config.yaml file. And for all intents and purposes, this is a configuration for the machine learning that Raza will do on your behalf. And what's gonna happen is you're gonna get text. And this text is picked up by a tokenizer. In this case, there will be this white space tokenizer over here. And then this pipeline step is adding tokens that are available to any other components that follow. And you can also say in this case that the text that I have over here, that is something that the tokens use. Next in the pipeline, we have lots of components that will add sparse features. So things like count vectorizers and lexical syntax features. So I will call that a featureization step. And what's gonna come out of this is just some sparse features. And again, just like before, Something that happened before in the pipeline is something that the current component needs. And that's because these sparse features uses the tokens. After we've generated our features, we'll move on to this diet classifier. And that's this step over here. And if we assume that there are no entities in this entire chatbot, then we can say that this diet classifier will give us an intent prediction. And again, the intent prediction relies on the sparse features. Now the idea is that we now have two other steps that follow. We have this response selector for frequently asked questions, 
And we have this other one for chit chat. So I'll write that down as the FAQ step over here, as well as the chit chat. And these are both response selector models. And you'll notice that they have this retrieval intent over here, meaning that they will focus only on frequently asked questions in the first one and on chit chat intents in the second response selector. Now what both of these models will do independently of each other is they will come up with a response prediction. And again, both of these models are independent of each other as well as independent of the diet classifier. And one thing that's worth pointing out in this particular configuration is that the features that both of these response selectors use, they are exactly the same as the features that the diet architecture uses. So perhaps more in general, when you're looking at this, you can maybe also imagine a slightly different diagram. I will have sparse features as well as dense features at my disposal. And you can imagine that these sparse and these dense features, they will go into the diet algorithm. And again, if I were to assume no entities, and once again, assuming that there are no entities to detect and only just some intents, then you can certainly imagine we would have intents like, hey, the user wants to order something, uh, there are some frequently asked questions, and also some chit chat. And there might very well be more, but let's just assume that these are the three main intents that this diet classifier has to detect. Well then schematically, what you could say is that we've got this FAQ model, and this model uses the same features, but the only thing it's concerned with are responses, which are responses for, let's say, frequently asked questions about nutrition or allergy information. And again, these responses, they correspond with some text, text that would answer, hey, for nutrition, go to this website, and for allergy, go to this website. But the thing to observe here, this frequently asked questions intent, if that is detected, then we can use that information to afterwards select the appropriate response from this model. And you can also imagine we would do a very similar thing for chit chat over here. And this gives us a degree of hierarchy that we might be able to use in our chatbot. And this hierarchy can be really beneficial because it allows us to have a somewhat general diet model as well as a more specialized FAQ model. And this specialization may very well increase the accuracy of our predictions. A question that you might have now though is how exactly this response selection works internally. So let's say I've got some text. And let's say that this is the text that I'm getting from the user. So this is the text from the utterance. It's what the user is currently saying. Well, then you might imagine that we have some sort of a numeric representation for it. And this can be a combination of word embeddings as well as some sparse features. But for all intents and purposes, I'll just assume we've got a numeric array of size M, and this will be the text representation. And you may also be able to imagine that we also have a similar thing with our response. And such a response can also be represented numerically. But we should be aware that it's probably a different representation. So you can imagine it might have a different dimensionality. But this is the response representation. And what I would really like to do at this point is to be able to say, hey, are these two a match? Does the text representation that I currently see really match my response that I have available that I might want to send back? And that would be a whole lot easier if I could transform both of these representations into something that has the same dimensionality, let's say K. And the trick that we can use to get there is to just put a feed forward layer in between that takes input from the left and then makes sure that we have something of size K on the other side. 
This way, I now have two vectors of the same dimension, which means that I can calculate all sorts of similarities for it. And because I will typically also have some training data, you might be able to imagine that if I have my label and if I have my similarity, well, then typically I can also come up with some sort of a loss function between the two. And if I have a loss and I have training data, then you can also imagine I have a gradient and that gradient will come in as a signal. And it will eventually go all the way back and finds its way to update these feed forward layers. And if you look at this diagram and think, hey, that looks familiar, you'd be right. What we're mentioning here is something that's very similar to the star space paper, which is something that we've mentioned in the previous video. And the main trick that we're applying here is saying, well, by just having one single layer added to whatever representation we have, both for the utterance text as well as for the responses, then we can move the representations in these arrays that have exactly the same shape. And that means that I can use whatever similarity that I'm interested in, be it cosine or dot product, but this is making it such that I am able to compare an utterance text to a response. And schematically, this is pretty much the algorithm that we're using. But there are a few implementation details that are worth mentioning though. And that is because the implementation of this algorithm inside of Raza is actually done on top of the diet algorithm. And that might sound somewhat counterintuitive. So in the next video on response selection, I'll discuss how we use diet as a backend to implement this algorithm. I hope you'll stay tuned for that.